at this. Look at this. Look at this. This thing has been functioning for hundreds, hundreds of years. Since before the beginning of modern times. Yeah, but this is different from the kind of time you were talking about before. Sunrise to sunset, Sabbath to Sabbath, isn't it? This is, uh, this is mechanical time, isn't it? You bet. You bet it is. You bet. I sometimes think that this clock, this machine, is what constitutes humanity's first real break from the world of nature. Wouldn't you say so? Hello? The clock did much more than that. It became the model of the cosmos. And then they mistook the model for the real thing. People got the idea that nature was just a giant clock, not a living organism, but a machine. That's exactly what I've been trying to tell this lunkhead, exactly, word for word. Maybe you recognize him. Jack Edwards, and you're? Uh, Sonia Hoffman. I think I've heard your name somewhere. Yeah, maybe in a couple of hundred news broadcasts. He was a candidate for the US presidency in the primaries. Oh, I vaguely remember. See, I'm not a voter. Most Americans don't vote either. I do know who you are. Me? You know who I am? I doubt it. I... You're Thomas Harriman, the poet. Well, yes, I am, but uh, wait a minute. Let me get this straight. You recognize me, a poet whose latest work sold all of 12,000 copies, but you do not recognize this gentleman who uh, was a presidential candidate in America? My God, woman, what's happened to your values? What do you do? I'm a scientist, and we do occasionally read poetry. As a matter of fact, I'm doing a lot of it these days. I'm on a sort of sabbatical. I'm an ex-physicist, an ex-American resident, an ex-voter. Ex-wife? This is very upsetting. Why don't intelligent people like yourself bother to vote? Well, forgive me, you politicians make it so hard. The ideas expressed by most of you, right and left, seem to me as antique and mechanical as that old clock. What's that supposed to mean? Well, if I was to explain that, I'd have to go all the way back to Descartes, if you remember him. Yeah. To be or not to be? I think, therefore, I am. Yeah, well, we both went to college, yeah. Well, Descartes was the primary architect of the view that sees the world as a clock. A mechanistic view that still dominates most of the world today, and it seems to me, especially you politicians. Mechanistic? Is that a real word? Mechanistic? Mechanical? Mechanics? Yeah, it's a good word. Mechanistic, as if nature functions like a clock. You take it apart, reduce it to a number of small, simple pieces, easy to understand, analyze them, put them all back together again, and then you understand the whole. Isn't that what's known as scientific thinking, Miss Hoffman? Really, what you call the mechanistic view, isn't that what the scientific method's all about? Is it? Well, I don't think so, but I'd like to kind of hear from the physicist, Jack. All right, I'm sorry. Please continue. Well... You're right, in a way, Mr... Um... Jack. Call me Jack. <laughs> okay, Jack. You are right, in a sense. But it wasn't always so. Not before Descartes. When he introduced such thinking, it amounted to a revolutionary break with the church. He said, I don't need the Pope to tell me how the world functions. I can find that out for myself. Because to me, the world is just a machine. And then he became fascinated with clockworks and made the clock into a central metaphor. He said, I consider the human body as nothing but a machine. A healthy man is like a well-made clock. A sick man is like an ill-made clock. Well, the metaphor seems a little clumsy now, but it worked, didn't it? <laughs> yes, yeah, so successfully that Scientists came to believe that all living things, plants, animals, us, are nothing but machines. And that's the fallacy. It carried over into everything, arts, politics. I don't know, it seems to me that most people don't even remember who Descartes was. I'm sorry, I guess I just don't follow you. But he'd like to. If you could just break it down into 30 second media bites, that's more what he's used to. Very funny. All right, what is it that I don't recognize? What's so bad about Descartes? 
But there's nothing bad about the cod. In fact, I think the cod is wonderful. He was a godsend to the 17th century. But times have changed since then. We need a new way of understanding life. That pendulum, for example, has long since been replaced by a tiny quartz crystal. And these magnificent hand torched wheels <laughs> turned into a microchip the, the size of my thumbnail. That's how far modern science has left mechanistic thinking behind. But you politicians, you seem to have that clockwork still ticking in your head. This right here, is, this is where the cutting edge of the work is. Right now, I am, we're, we're all talking about how we want to look to the uh, chemistry and physics for modeling. And uh, Da Vinci said that no real science, or no exact science, can be called science unless you can model it mathematically. So what we're going to talk about today is how, how do you go about modeling socioeconomics systems mathematically. And this is, the, this is where the, the future will be. Uh, Russian mathematician Vladimir Arnold says, uh, thermodynamics is based on a very complicated branch of mathematics called contact geometry. According to Gibbs, the geometrical structure of thermodynamics is described by a contact manifold equipped with a contact form whose zeros define the laws of thermodynamics, where epsilon is energy, T is temperature, eta is entropy, P is pressure, V is volume. Gibbs is the main person you're going to want to go to here to get your theories from, and it gives us very difficult to read, because as you see here, he writes in Greek and also in English. So he says, if we call this contact five manifold, the Gibbs manifold, the Gibbs thesis is this, substances are the generated sub-manifolds on the Gibbs manifold. And so in speaking in simple terms, the socioeconomic system is called what is called a heterogeneous substance. And people inside of the system are called chemical substances. And if you map this, you get these three-dimensional plots. You can plot the energy, the volume, and the entropy of the socioeconomic system and get these thermodynamic Cartesian plots. When you do it in socioeconomic terms to correct, clarify things, you do not plot en energy, but you plot enthalpy because socioeconomic systems are, this is for an isobaric, isophoric system, which means that you have constant pressure, atmospheric pressure, but you also have constant volume, which means your social boundary doesn't change. So just to give an example here, when a year ago when Russia invaded Georgia, there was an expansion outward of the socioeconomic boundary of Russia into Georgia. So that's what's called an iso, you have, then you have isothermal process, isothermal, isobaric, means constant temperature, constant pressure, and then you would be plotting what's called the enthalpy, which is a function of skips the energy. So the long and the short of the story here is, uh, Georgia was talking about you want to be able to predict, you want to make an economic model that predicts if you're, you want to run a society based on real world models. Any kind of prediction you want to do in sociology and economics, you're going to have to turn to what's called the negative of the change in the Gibbs free energy, because the free energy is what physical chemists use to predict small scale reactions that are occurring in a, in a battery, in a surface, in a test tube. So if the predictions can work here, it's just a matter of scaling this up to whatever however you want to predict your relationships. Here's Newtonian geometry. So, Newtonian geometry is real simple. It's for projectile geometry. So you throw up a, a football and it travels through a curved arc. And if you calculate the change in the distance with respect to time, you can get calculate the first derivative gives you the velocity, the second derivative gives you the acceleration. So when your slope reaches zero here, continue, continuing to zero, the slope implies the object is at rest. This is equivalent in your in the economic equilibrium. The economy is stalled out and there's no more movement. So, in the same way, when you carry this over to Gibbsian geometry, this is what you're going to get for your socioeconomic. Uh, when you say you want to, when Da Vinci says, no real science is real science unless you can explain it mathematically. So this is where you're going to get your real science explanations from. Most of this is, on the surface, it looks fairly complicated. So here we have just two variable systems. But in Gibbs geometry, we have a five contact geometry system, which means that we're modeling the volume change, the enthalpy change, which is kind of the energy of the system, and that correlates to bonds, social economic bonds, plus your kinetic energy, or your, your pressure volume and your energy, and then you have what's called your transformation content energy, which is everyone else's entropy, and most people know that. So in the same way, 
You can calculate the derivative, calculate the economic equilibrium that's equivalent to when the slope reaches zero. And it gives you in geometry terms, you're going to get these same graphs, but they're just going to be, let's take that. They're going to look like this. So it gives me the first uh, thermodynamic geometry graphs. And this AB right here is your free energy. This is available energy. This is what, if you can measure this AB system in your socio, this, this slope right here, in your socioeconomic system, you can predict whether your economic model will progress. This is your capacity for entropy. Now, again, this is very complicated material. Gibbs, uh, Willard Gibbs, for everyone who does know, he's America's first uh, PhD engineer. And he's the founder of chemical thermodynamics. When he first wrote his work, he sent it out to 200 of the leading scientists. And there's only one person that was able to understand his work, and that was James Clerk Maxwell. He's the first behind the theory of the electromagnetic field, that, that where the, the, everything around us, the force, the force that uh, when we did our social experiment just now, you lifted the pencil, you moved the pencil, and I moved you in the first part. The force in each of those cases is the electromagnetic force. And the person behind that is James Maxwell. And to get to our graphs here, Gibbs sent, this, sent his work out to Maxwell. And Maxwell spent the next the entire winter constructing a three dimensional graph because Gibbs only made things to two dimensions. So what Maxwell did is he take this, he used, went out in sunlight, and he took this plot and this plot, and he used the sunlight to make these. These, these iso contours of constant volume and constant temperature, and use the sunlight to carve the slope center. So first you made a graph. If you flip this around on the back side here, upside down, and you flip this around underneath, you get first you can draw things out, then you can make a plaster mold plus of this. And he sent this to Gibbs as a gift in 1775. So this is, and just to give you a simple, simple example, here's over 700 equations underlying all this. It, it, this is where the future rolls, the future lies, but over here is one example by Adrian, physical chemist Adrian Delange. You can find that on the online site. He took, this is a mixture of what Gibbs did here. You see the word term free energy. This is a mixture of uh, uh, swing to chaos, progression bifurcation theory, which is uh, what I understand you, you did your dissertation on progression. So he mixes Gibbs chemical thermodynamics here, progression far from equilibrium thermodynamics, plus this is evolution, Darwinian evolution which is uh, the idea that there is uh, survival of the fittest. So this is survival of the fittest and it's mixed with all of this and you get this three-dimensional graph here. That's just one example that shows you that you can take these concepts and apply them to socioeconomics. Here's your socioeconomic system here. Now, this is what's called the Freud-Schiller drive theory. To give you another example, the A, B part on the graph that I showed you here, this AB right here, Freud read about this. This is another example where you can, you don't even have to use equations. I'm, I'm going to show you a lot of equations today, but Freud took, just took the verbal concepts of free energy, and this is bound energy. If you multiply the entropy times the temperature of the system, you get what's called bound energy. So what Freud did was he took, he read Kemmels in 1882 to find free energy, as he says, given the unlimited validity of Clausius' the second law, it's the change in the free energy, not the total energy resulting from heat production within any system which determines in which sense the infinity is going to be accurate. Now the infinity here is this is the infinity. This is the, the force, the chemical for electromagnetic force that caused these two human molecules to bind into the, the dot, what's called the dihumanite molecules. Two molecules bind into one structure. And there's, there's chemical energy stored in this bond. But what Hamilton proved was that it's the, the change in your socioeconomic system is measured by free energy, whereas this is the macro quantitative measure of your socioeconomic system. The affinity is the micro aspect. Why does an individual person, person uh, have a desire to purchase a, a good? What Hemel showed mathematically is that the derivative of the free energy of your system, in order for the socioeconomic system to progress, the derivative of the free energy change with respect to time has to be less than zero. So if Freud took this concept and applied it to psychology. I have to do some remarks from a physicist point of view about what I heard so far. Uh, well, not about the, only the last paper. When, uh, firstly, when we, when we translate uh, 
physical quantity like energy, entropy, into psychological or sociological quantities, we should uh, take care, uh, be measurable, because entropy and uh, energy are measurable. Uh, secondly, we spoke a lot about the conservation of energy and the maximal principle of entropy. Conservation of energy uh, holds only in systems that we never meet in nature or society, in isolated systems. Uh, also, uh, as well, uh, the maximal entropy only in isolated systems in equilibrium states. Uh, I like very much. Uh, uh, I like very much the uh, slide uh, with, uh, with the split between uh, Newtonian geometry and uh, Gibbsian geometry. Yeah, Gibbs, we learned Gibbs. Gibbs. Gibbsian. 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 Mm. Yep. Uh, well, Gibbs. Not uh, any physics are applicable in uh, economics, of course, uh, but uh, the physics of interacting agents, of, uh, that is the statistical mechanics from which we can define the thermodynamical quantities and so on. Uh, well, uh, in order to be uh, closer to the reality. I think the slide uh, should be completed with uh, some Grigorgian geometry or Nicoli's geometry because uh, real what, systems... What is the second name? Nicoli? Nicoli's. Because the uh, systems uh, we investigate uh, are far from equilibrium, are open systems and far from equilibrium systems. Uh, would be interesting uh, mm -hmm. such a geometry. Yes, I, there is a thank you. No, rather less rigorous in such a geometry than you think. less all, all very good points. That's a big subject that has to be worked out because when Prigozhin won his, when he did his work between the 70s and up until 2000, when Prigozhin passed in 2002, his view was the dominant view of the, the way thermodynamics is to be applied. So there's still a dominant mindset of people. They, a lot of people believe that right now humans are existing in a state far from equilibrium. And the idea is that some people will even write books that say, right now I exist at the edge of chaos. And some people believe that. And it's, uh, there's a, uh, there has to be a compromise between the two, Prigozhin and Gibbs. And that's something that has to be worked out. Because it's not the idea that uh, right now, we're at, every day you wake up and you're at the edge of chaos is a, is a miss understanding of, of the translation from thermodynamics, particularly Prigozhin's variety, and non-equilibrium thermodynamics to socioeconomics. It's a, more of a translation of Bernard cell dynamics, whereas it, when you heat the fluid, of, you take a Bernard cell of, of uh, silicon oil, whale oil, and you, when you heat it up, the system is a homogeneous. It's a homogeneous liquid. And so when you heat it up past a certain Reynolds number, these structured, ordered structures form, these hexagonal cells called Bernard cells. And the idea of Prigozhin is that you have, you go from or, uh, disorder to order, and it has to, you have to heat the system up past a certain threshold. So what he's saying there, a lot of people have this belief right now, there's a lot of truth to Prigozhin, but it has to be reconciled with uh, the way chemical reactions actually occur in the test tube. And the, that is, uh, the idea is that you mix two chemicals together, they will continue reacting until they reach the equilibrium point. So there has, there's a balance between have heat flow through society, like Prigozhin says, but there's also people react in chemical systems when, say, two countries debate each other or when uh, you go into a party or something simple like this, there's chemical reactions. But all very good points. It's a very big subject that has to be worked out. Here's Memke's in December of last year with co-authors, physicist Peter Richman and physicist Stefan Hutzler at the book launch party of their new Econophysics and Physical Economics. We're in... They apply the laws of thermodynamics as developed by Willard Gibbs to economics. Now here is the social Newton rankings for existive 
social newtons. And we see that Mimkes is ranked in at number one. So to try to explain what Mimkes work is all about, I'm going to use the example of Bill Gates in the previous clip. Gates says that in January of 1975, he made a call after which he went on a remarkable journey. And 32 years later, he's giving the commemoration speech at Harvard, the school that he dropped out of. One of my biggest memories of Harvard came in January 1975 when I made a call from Courier House to a company in Albuquerque, New Mexico that had begun making the world's first personal computer. I offered to sell them software. I worried they would realize I was just a student in a dorm and hang up on me. Instead, they said, we're not quite ready. Come see us in a month, which was a good thing because we hadn't written the software yet. <laughs> From that moment, I worked day and night on the extra credit project that marked the end of my college education and the beginning of a remarkable journey with Microsoft. To explain, everyone knows that when a rock falls off a cliff, you can say that it goes on a remarkable journey and falls through a gravitational potential and reaches the ground at a certain time later. And it falls through what's called the gravitational potential. And the person who formulated those equations of motions are Newton. Now the same equations of motion apply just when Gates falls through what's called the gravitational electromagnetic potential through his remarkable journey and goes through his reaction path and rides up 32 years later as a one of the biggest computer moguls in the world. The difference between the gravitational potential and the gravitational electromagnetic potential that Gates fell through is that the equations of motion are come from Willard Gibbs and they're called, what's called the Gibbsian. To explain, or to give a little history, in the 17th century, Newton formulated the laws of motion. Then, in the next century, Lagrange formulated what's called a force function, which, in a, which is an equation that maps the movement of particles in the system by way of summation of their potential energy added with their kinetic energy to give one equation that gauges the tendency for the system to decrease to its lowest potential. That in turn got rewritten by William Hamilton in terms of the what's called the Hamiltonian. That in turn got re-modified by first Rudolf Clausius in, into the form of the first and second law of thermodynamics and then by American engineer Willard Gibbs in terms of the chemical potential of an isothermic isobaric system which is what social systems are. Now the first person to do that historically, to take the work of Willard Gibbs and apply it to social systems and economic systems was Lawrence Henderson at Harvard, who added the work of Vilfredo Pareto, who's behind us right here, together with Gibbs and taught an entire curriculum of this at Harvard in the 1930s. So what Memkes is doing is taking the Lagrangian formulated formulating that into the Gibbsian and explaining the potentials of economic systems and social systems, just as Newton formulated the mechanics of the solar system or, say, rocks fall into its gravitational potential. Now, what this gets into is the sense of senses of purpose. In the old days, Aristotle would say that the rock fell through a height because it was tele teleologically going towards, towards its final cause. That is its optimal location in the universe. Aristotle teleology, however, is an outdated theory and it's defunct now. We now no longer understand a rock falling as being its, as being its teleological purpose. In the same way that we do not say that Gates' teleological purpose was to form Microsoft, but we do say that Gates, in that when he made that phone call, divined a sense of purpose, as Einstein would say, and then he fell through his gravitational potential and reacted with society forming Microsoft. So that's the gist of what Memkes is doing in his work and why he's the number one social Newton, is that he's taking Lagrangian, mixing that together, formulating the Gibbsian, 
and applying that to sociology and economics, and nobody in America right now is doing that.